From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights, with your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers Insiders, Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. All right, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Rant. A little 52-17 loss to Michigan. There was hope. There was despair. There was the best punting outfit in college football history. A quote that that just belongs in the great annals of Jim Harbaugh moments coming to Piscataway. Um, fellas, I'm not sure where to start, so let's just start how we felt at halftime. And I, the, the two of you guys thought you were going to be covering the biggest career moment of your careers. I saw fear in your eyes, which was good. Uh, but to, to put it lightly, that did not last. And Rutgers, obviously. Uh, fell apart. Should we have seen it coming, Brian? I mean, is that is that just was it? Were we expecting too much at halftime? Yeah, in hindsight, it seemed uh, pretty obvious that things would turn around. Uh, there were some stats from Michigan. Apparently, they do this a lot. They have terrible first halves, maybe not terrible, but terrible by their standards, and then they come out and blow teams out in the third quarter. I was not aware of this. So, as you mentioned, uh, I was in the press box with Pat shaking in my boots, worrying about having to watch the. <laughs> the goalposts come down and go to the Raritan river. And I'm jockeying with you with who gets to, you know, walk with yeah. the people to the Raritan river. Uh, and then obviously the, the inevitable, it seems like the, the website interceptions happen and things kind of uh, collapse from there. But uh, I think the way I kind of look at it is the first half is a sign of what this could be if all goes well. And the second half is kind of just a culmination of all the issues that are causing them to not get there right now. Um, but yeah, it still though, I would rather be prepared at halftime, getting ready for a potential huge upset. Then it's the fourth quarter, the game's close, and I'm, you know, wondering what the heck am I going to write? So, what we decided for 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 listeners who are curious was that I was going to follow the goalposts to the rafters, and only if the students could get them out of the stadium, which I was very skeptical about. I, I you know, I, I thought that there was some some serious obstacles. I mean, if fans themselves can't get out of the stadium, I can't imagine that the goalposts were going to be able to make it out. So that was where I was at. Obviously, it didn't happen, Pat. I mean, I, I guess, you know, when you see, when you looked at the box score, looked there, it was one rushing yard or something crazy like that in the first half. Michigan was just dominating up the line, of, along the line of scrimmage. And then, obviously, uh, Gavin Wimsett had some freshman moments. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Those three interceptions were rookie mistakes, to say the least. But I thought the real – it's so – one of the interesting points of the game were those two goal line – scenarios where Rutgers almost made the stop and you were thinking like, Oh my God, they're going to do it. They didn't do it, but it's just the red zone defense has been so bad. And uh, those were like a real epitomies uh, or that was like the epitome of how bad the goal red zone defense has been, even though those, those two stand almost stands were miraculous. Yeah. I mean, that did give you hope. I mean, when Tyree Powell made that big stop uh on third down knocking the michigan running back back I, I thought well okay i mean this is the kind of stuff that has to happen for them to pull the upset but damn it didn't happen and the second half i i guess that it kind of unfolded the way i thought the game was going to unfold brian you broke down the film you watched all of uh gavin wimps had throws i guess we're starting to see something build with him getting sean ryan involved there's some good stuff going on too uh, but these are just decisions that i mean i get it freshmen will make mistakes but just kind of unacceptable for a big 10 quarterback. Yeah. And it's kind of uh, the risk you take with starting him and letting him play through the growing pains. Uh, I do think the throws that he made that were good, were really good. That throw to Sean Ryan down the right sideline was very impressive. I thought, mm -hmm. and he bounced back from, I think he missed the throw earlier, like the, the, the play before uh, the conversion to Crookshank on the rub route on a fourth down in the red zone. That's a big boy play right there to make that connection and, and get that first down and then throw the touchdown to Sean Ryan across the field, the next play, the, the signs are there of what he can do when he's rolling out of the pocket and throwing the ball. He looks athletic. Uh, we asked Greg Schiano about why he's not running the ball as much. It seems like they're kind of protecting him after that injury against Temple. Uh, so if he could add that aspect to his game, you know, in the future, that'll help things. Uh, but yes, the, the, the glaring issues that are there really, really hold him back. The interceptions, uh, the first interception, he just didn't see the guy go back in coverage, which is just a part of, you know, reading college defenses an aspect yeah. that he is obviously learning. Learning. Uh, the the second one is again an issue that he just hasn't learned how to throw with touch. He threw that ball like a laser to Aaron Cruikshank when he's five yards ahead of him. The receiver can't catch the ball and it lands in the linebacker's hand. So the, the issue, the things with these mistakes are they seem to be correctable. The the worry that I have is that it's been six games, uh, six of the last seven games he's thrown an interception. A lot of them are looking similar. I don't think 
I'm confident in him, him being able to fix these issues until he can go an entire game with thro- without throwing an interception. It just feels like every time he goes out to, to, to throw the ball, an interception is coming at any moment. Right. And if you're looking for positives, he is certainly a cool customer. Didn't get rattled. Uh, he, show, he showed up to his uh, post-game media availability. And we were wondering, all right, they're going to make – he's starting quarterback, starting quarterback, star- talks to the media, win or lose. I was skeptical. I thought they might not make him available because he's a freshman. To their credit, they did. Uh, and there he sh- shows up in a David Bowie T-shirt. I'm like, all right, this this kid's got some style. I like that. That was that was something I didn't expect to see. Um, handled the media well. Uh, has done all the other things around the program well. You know, the running thing I think is a is a is a big deal, uh, Patrick, because that takes away, uh, you know, half of what would, would cer- certainly if Rutgers can't get a running game otherwise, if he was able to add that with some RPOs, create that part of it. I mean, it could change this offense. But then again, without Sam Brown, I don't know if it would make a difference. It's uh, quite con- quite the conundrum. They can't if they can't run the ball, all the pressure falls on the quarterback. So how can how can Rutgers take some of the burden off of a freshman passer? It's by running the ball, but that seems to be a catch twenty two. So I think the we, like like Brian said when we asked Greg about it today, he said that the injury is still kind of lingering. You'll see his ankle kind of. You'll see him limp at times, Greg said, and his ankle still isn't 100%. So maybe that's a, a credit to why he's not running the ball as much. But when he was running that RPO, it was helping the rushing attack. And without it, Rutgers hasn't been able to run the ball at all. So yeah, until they can get that going, it's going to be all the pressure on the passing game. And, and that can't happen, uh, you know, in Big Ten play. No, not with, especially not with this offense still being a work in progress to put it uh, mildly. Uh, all right. We got to cover the Harbaugh comment on, on Corsac. We weren't in the press conference, but he called <laughs> said that, that Rutgers had maybe the best punting outfit in college football history, which was great. And I understand why he's impressed because I mean, those two kicks that, <laughs> that Corsac was rushed. It looked like the punt we blocked the first punt he hit. He managed to punt underneath the Michigan players outstretched arms and it's still the ball rolled for 51 yards. It might be, and he's not as great as punt. I, I get it. There's a long list of there, but it's probably top five of the Corsac punts, right? I mean, that's hard to top. And I don't know if you can send that quote. Be like, if you're, if Jimmy Gill from Rutgers, great sports information directors, making a portfolio to send off to the Ray guy award people, you would think that they would include Jim Harbaugh's comment, which just cracked me up. It was a great comment. It was a great game from from Corsac. A little outside the boot action, the the Trivella, the the soccer move. I, I like to see it, and uh, it seems like he's close to becoming uh, the punter with the most punts in the history of college football. That's going to be his. What next... is that? No, how, how far off is he from that? I think he was twenty three coming into Saturday, so he's sixteen away. Yeah, and, and to do That's that. Doable. To do that, to have that performance on the weekend, the first weekend of college football after the legendary Ray guy dies, I think it's uh, all very poetic. Man, that's doable. Sixteen. Wow, that would be a, that would be quite a, something to hang uh, hang in the, on your resume there. Not bad. All right, so let's dive into true or false. We're going to do something special here, true or false, because tonight you might be listening to this tomorrow. Whenever you're listening to this right now, Rutgers is preparing to open the season against Columbia and basketball. So we thought we would do for our basketball preview, we would do a basketball edition, true or false, to launch us into a discussion about Steve Peichel's crew. You guys, can you switch? Can you switch hats? You ready for some hoops? Hoops questions? Yes, sir. You got it. No, Brian right. is. That's for no, sure. Brian. Of course, Brian is. Yes, wait. Well, he he came up with the questions, Pat. So you're the you're the only one who he really is on the. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll do my part. best. True or false? The breakout surprise player for the Scarlet Knights will be Derek Simpson. Fun second. True or false? False. Oh, okay. Pat, true or false? I'll go true, so we have something to talk about. Yes, I'm going true as well. True or false? Cliff Omori, can you pronounce it for me one more time? Can we just get it right? Omori, Omori. We changed it to Omori, I know. God, why don't I do it? All right, Cliff Omori will have the best season for a Rutgers big man since Roy Hinson. True or false, Fonseca? True, the hype train is real and he lives up to it. Okay, Pat? I'm upset that the question isn't Hamadi Enjai. That's big man. <laughs> oh, so... That is a good point wow okay yeah for that. i forgot about how many absolutely so false because the question is bad 
That's good. I like it. All right. I'm going to go true, but I do worry about injuries uh, since he's had some troubles with that in his career. All right. True or false. Rutgers will lose to a non, will lose a non-conference game to a tomato can once again. We're not going to suffer one of these losses, are we? NJIT or something. One second. True or false. Well, not NJIT because they're not on the schedule, but true. Oh, it will happen. Oh, no. Who's a guy? Come on. Pat, true or false? False. Yeah, I'm going to false too. I think they've, that was, that was a, well, yeah, it's not going to happen again. I can't, I can't deal with that. All right, true or false? Rutgers will finish higher than eighth in the Big Ten standings where those clueless media folks like Brian Fonseca picked them. Brian, true or false? Considering I picked them sixth, I will say true. You picked them thick. Oh, nice. Six. Okay. Pat? True. Yeah, I think it's true too. Absolutely. We're sleeping on the Scarlet Knights. All right, true or false? Rutgers will have multiple honorable mention Big Ten selections for the second straight year. Uh, oh, sorry, multiple non-honorable mention all 10 big selections for the second straight year. Long got second, Gio got third last year. Uh, the big ask, Brian, true or false? False. Wow, okay. Pat? I'm going to go true because yeah. Caleb McConnell is going to get some credit too, I think. You would think Caleb will get it and Cliff will get it. And you would think, okay, he's got a shot too. All right, the true or false, Steve Pike will be assessed a technical foul for the first time in his career this season. Pikes is going to erupt. True or false? One second. False. Pat? True. The program is just at it's that time. <laughs> He's going to throw a chair across the court in, in Bobby Knight fashion. I'm going to go false as well. Uh, and finally, true or false? Rutgers will make a third consecutive NCAA tournament appearance, but this time it will not be by the skin of its teeth. All right? Brian, true or false? I will go false. They will make the tournament, but it will be the last day by the absolute skin of their teeth. Wow. Okay. Pat? I agree with Brian, so false. No, I'm going true. They're going to make it, and it's going to be relatively oh, wow. comfortable. That's my prediction. Uh, all right. So let's go through this. Who is the breakout surprise player, then, if it's not Derek Simpson? It's going to be Mawat Mag. I think he's in Mawat. store for a big year. Uh, he's finally healthy. He has a sizable role that Ron Harper Jr. graduated now. Uh, he showed some flashes in big spots last year, notably in that upset over number one Purdue. He was arguably their second best player uh, after Ron in that game. Um, and uh, I think he, uh, the staff is high on him. I think he is poised to to have a big year and break out uh, and become a household name. The consistency there doesn't concern you with him? I don't think he's ever had a chance to show any consistency yeah. because, you know, Ron Harper Jr. is playing 30 minutes a night. So I, it's a concern, sure, but I think he'll he'll be able to, to put a string together some good games. All right, I've just heard so much about Derek Simpson word of mouth that I just think he's going to be a good guy off the bench. Uh, that was my pick. You picked him as well, right, Pat? I picked. I was going to go with Mawat Mag, so you did. good job, okay. Brian. Good job, Brian. All right. Uh, we said Cliff, big Cliff. We're ready for him the big year. Who are they going to lose to? Who, what, what tomato can could they possibly lose to? Here's my here's my guess. The other are you. Ryder comes in oh. trying to print the battle, and uh, they're fired up. They're, uh, they have a good team down there in the MAC. And, uh, but it could be anybody. It could be, it could be Coppin state the day before New Year's Eve. It could be, you know, it could be Bucknell, uh, the fighting Greg Shiano's two days before Christmas. It could be really anybody, this program, uh, when you lose to Lafayette, all bets are off. It really can happen to anybody. Yeah. I, I mean, I can see the concern. Um, but I would think it'd be more likely that they would lose to one of those better teams. And even if it's a mild upset, like a temple, uh, someone like that, where you'd be like, Oh gee, that's a disappointing loss, but not a, you know, Holy crap, Lafayette loss. Pat, what do you think? I'm going to say not so much a tomato can, but you got to circle that Miami game at some point too as being yeah, one of the best they're, non-conference they're, games for, for sure. Yeah, no, that, that's, a real, that's a real game. Are they going to beat Seton Hall this year? I think so, although I do think that Shaheen Holloway is going to have the boys uh, playing better than many expect. I think he is uh, an outstanding coach, not just because of the St. Peter's thing, but he's shown it uh, throughout his career, and he's got some he's got some dudes on that roster. So, uh, right. But I think Rutgers is hungry to... Uh, to, to get the win in that game in the rack. They've beaten them there two years in a row. I don't think they've ever lost at the rack against Seton Hall under Steve Peichel. Um, so I think they'll keep that streak going. St. Peter's raising their banner today with literally no one involved there. Kind of sad. All right. we What else do we have here? So let's talk about realistic expectations. The team wants to make the NCAA tournament. They believe it's possible. Why do you think it'll be skin of the teeth? They haven't proven otherwise, right? I think, and especially they have they didn't do so with two of the best players in modern program history and Rod Harper Jr. and Geo Baker. There's a lot of unknowns on this team. I think Cliff yeah. Omori is 
pretty set solid to be one of the better players in the Big Ten. I'm convinced he's going to be a first or second team all Big Ten guy. But I don't see anybody really proven behind him as far as Caleb McConnell, for example, who is uh, probably not going to play in the season opener by the time people are to still know. Uh, I'm assuming he's not going to come back from his knee tweak. Is he going to be able to maintain his defensive player of the year? level to this point and if he is is he going to be able to make a jump on the offensive end i'm i'm not so sure about that is cam spencer ready to make the jump from the low majors to the high majors it's a question mark is moat mag going to make that jump is Derek simpson going to be able to play good backup minutes as a freshman there's just so many question marks about this team so if a team that was as solid as it was last year couldn't do it i'm just not ready to say that even in a weaker big 10 that this team with so many question marks is going to be able to kind of march right in get a top four finish and be a you know shoe in seven seed do we have any idea when Caleb McConnell is going to be back? Like no. Like a ballpark figure? Uh, I like would guess. Not, we're not talking January, are we? We're, we're... No. I, my, my understanding is it's not season-threatening by any sense, stretch of the imagination. Uh, I, I I believe he'll be back by Temple. I think they're uh, playing it cautiously. I, I was at practice last week, and he was not cleared yet. It was This was Thursday. He was still working out on the side. I think – the, the, the question is, though, it was a tweak at Media Day a month ago. It's been four weeks. Four weeks isn't a tweak anymore. So yeah. I guess we'll ask Steve Peichel and, and we'll see if he says anything tonight. But um, I do think it's we're at a point where concern is certainly uh, logical. But I do think that uh, my guess is they'll miss the first three games against these tomato cans and uh, he'll come back for Temple when things start to get serious. Rutgers with these injuries lately and the information is just um, just hard to come by, to put it, uh, to put it mildly. Nice. That's how I tweeted, you know, basketball and football season are overlapping when you get injury updates like this. <laughs> Better not see the same doctor who diagnosed Sam Brown. We'll see you in September, Caleb. Uh, all right. Good job, guys. That was good. Uh, good basketball preview. We've got some basketball questions in our uh, insider questions that will uh, will get us back to hoops a little bit. Uh, let's go there now. All right, uh, you guys. Uh, thanks, for, as always, for your questions. The insider uh, was hopping after <laughs> during. I love the the texts we get during the game. At halftime, everyone was happy, and then by the third quarter, th some of the texts were just uh, hilariously outraged. So thanks for thanks for doing that. You keep us amused. All right, lots of Gavin questions, and and this is a good one about the interceptions. Why the angst for Wimsett's interceptions? You knew with one yard rushing in the first half, it was foreboding. Teal, Ryan Teal, I'm sorry, Mike Teal and Ryan Hart threw a boatload of interceptions. They are one and two in the are your rec record book with over 9,000, 8,000 yards passing. Teal threw 49 and Hart 52. That doesn't mean Gavin won't be a star here. It's a good question. I mean, how, how, how much should we be worried about interceptions? They are part of the passing game. Do you want to take that, Brian? Thoughts? I am not convinced that that is a good argument because, yes, Mike Teal and Ryan Hart had a lot of interceptions. So did Art Sitkowski. I, I think he's still backing up Tommy DeVito at Illinois at this point. I don't think that's an argument to be made. Uh, to your point, to that point, though, I don't know if it's right. It's time to hit the panic button. I asked Greg Schiano if these are just growing pains of a young quarterback or if it raises any concerns on his end about him being a starting caliber quarterback in the long haul. Greg Schiano seems adamant that it is uh, the growing pains of a young quarterback. I tend to agree with him, but I have to see by the end of the season in these last three games, him not throwing an interception in one game. I have to see it or else I'm going to enter the offseason with a lot of questions. And look, eight interceptions in, in nine career games, eight interceptions in 90 career passes, that's a lot, even for a freshman. I get it. it it's, he's young. He can develop. I do think that if it, it, you don't see progress, if you don't see him avoiding these mistakes, it is time to, to start raising concerns. But it is still a bit early. I will agree. All right, and there was, as usual, we get about two or three of these a a, a week. Questions about Wimset and the transfer portal. Frank from Hillsborough wants to know: Do you think the main reason he's starting is because Gleason, the man who recruited him, was fired, and they were afraid of losing him to the transfer portal? That's Frank. Uh, and uh, the other one was history. This is from Joe Woost on on uh, on Twitter. History tells us that sticking with Wimset is not very Shiano like Is this because of the fear of transferring? Again, the guys, we got we've got nothing. I mean, I, at least I haven't heard anything to give me any indication that uh, Gavin is not 100% happy here. I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't sitting in the front row of the student section for, for tonight's basketball game as he's done last year. Yeah, but it's a fear, I guess. Every, everybody's right now with the transfer portal, NIL, you can tra pretty much transfer freely. It's got to be a concern. But I mean, Pat, have you sensed anything to make you think that this is a major concern? No, and, and I think all the skepticism on the side and rumors around Gavin have been 
in a lot of ways skunked out, right? Yeah. Like we we did some reporting that the six figure deal that he came here to Rutgers early that turned out to be not true. Uh, I, I just think, like you said, he seems like a happy kid. He seems happy go lucky too, and I, I think everything at Rutgers is just. It just takes time and patience, and and that's his biggest thing. Is he wants to be patient with this too? He's not ready to just jump ship after one half a season and start over. I think he understands that development takes time, and and he's willing to wait. So, I yeah. I, I don't like these questions, Steve. You don't like them. All right. Well, sorry. Maybe you should subscribe and ask some questions yourself. Then I don't yeah. know. Okay. Next time we get Gavin, which should be Saturday, we'll ask him. How about that? Cool. You go for it. You do that up there in East Lansing and tell, tell me how that goes. All right. Yeah. And I, I totally agree. will get him again me. next week. That's probably right. how it's going. You'll, never, you'll never talk to him again. All right. Uh, and Alex from Freehold, the last question on, on, on Wimsett. If Wimsett's effort was against Indiana or Purdue and not against Michigan stellar defense, how different would we be feeling? Yeah, I can, I can kind of get that point. You know, I, 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 it's all, in some ways, I would I guess if you knew what was going to happen here with, with Wimsett taking over the rest of the year, I would guess you would like to see him how, would, how he would have done against Indiana. Would he have won that game? Would he have, you know, been, would he have had gaudy numbers against a bad defense? He's not going to play a bad defense this year because Maryland's not a great defense. But I mean, yeah, it's just, it's, we're not, he's not going to have that opportunity, right, Brian? I mean, we're, we're just going to have to judge him against pretty good defenses. And Michigan State isn't terribly elite either. Um, I mean, Where are yes, they rank in the Big Ten? Are they top I, half? I don't have the stats in front of me, but I have you to reckon. things. Top, I, come on. I should. It's Monday. I don't do my film review until Wednesday of the opponent. So, uh, but I, I don't. I yes, he's not playing Indiana level defenses. I agreed, and I would have liked to see how he would do against that. Uh, I guess the only sample size we have is Wagner earlier in the year, but uh, not exactly representative. Right, he didn't play well against Wagner, so that's a good point. All right, next question. We got a question about recruiting, uh, and this is probably better for Todrick, but he's not here, so we'll do the best we can. The 2023 recruiting class is underwhelming at best. I know 2022 was one of our better classes in school history, and we have a lot of young starters. But part of the hype around bringing Shiano back was that he knew how to recruit New Jersey. I feel like we need depth to build depth. We need to get better in the coming years. And we haven't done a great job recruiting any of the New Jersey parochial powers. This is Josh in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, Pat, are you surprised by that? I mean, given you have uh, nuns and Augie Hoffman on the staff that they haven't done a better job with the New Jersey parochial powers? I am. I am surprised. Uh, you have two of the most powerful and influential coaches to come from those two schools on the staff. And you're right. Those four and five star guys are just not coming to Rutgers. Now, Rutgers has never really gotten any of those guys. And I thought maybe Augie and Nunzio would change that. And Shiano obviously being back as well. Like he got Darius Hamilton and Savon Huggins in his first go around. Those were five star guys from the big North parochial. So I am surprised by it. I think it is concerning, but I think part of it is just the trend in, in athletes, young athletes. They want the big flashy bright lights and they're, they want to go to winning programs. And I think until Rucker starts winning consistently, they're not going to get those flashy, top recruits in New Jersey that are seemingly all at parochial schools this day and age. Right. That's the Just difference look, too. Anthony Davis. Yeah. Right. He would have been at, he'll be now at a Burton Catholic or, or to IMG Academy in Florida. <laughs> right. Um, and looking at their fifth, it's never good, never a good thing when you have to click and load more to see where they are ranked. They're 51st in the 2023 recruiting class. From what I understand, I don't know if this is true of the, or this is just what, People say when you don't get guys from in-state, but it's a down year for New Jersey recruits in 2023. I guess 2024 is better. I don't know how much that matters, Brian. It, it you know, until until it, I guess until it becomes it's a big problem when they don't win. Right now, you do see a lot of young players in the roster, so it's hard to be very con concerned. Right, and I think the number of players they have committed currently is it's a bit of a smaller class. I think they're. Yeah probably going to attack the portal a bit to fill in the holes. Shannon will show that he can do that to success through the first couple of years since he's been back. I think that's part of the strategy as well. Uh, but I, yes, the, the down year in New Jersey, it's always too tough to tell if people say that because it's true or because to defend the fact they haven't uh, gotten any kids. I'm no recruiting expert myself. I don't know. We'd have to ask Todrick, but you raise a fair question. All right, let's, uh, let's dive into some basketball questions. Uh, this is from Alex and Freehold. If we had to pick one player who starts a season 
eighth off the bench who could come and become a fifth or sixth man off the bench? Who would it be? Like, who's the one guy who might emerge later in the season, Brian? You got a, you got a name that's going to come uh, become a, become someone who uh, could make an impact. So the first three guys off the bench are going to be Derek Simpson. He'll be the first. He'll be the backup point guard behind Paul Mulcahy. Mm. Um, Andre Hyatt will be the first forward off the bench behind Moat Mag, and uh, Dean Reber is going to be the backup five, backup four, depending on what they want to do there. I think he'll he'll be the backup five behind Cliff, though. Uh, and then I guess to that end, Antoine Wolfolk, the uh, true freshman yeah. big man football player, uh, he, he has impressed the staff. He's impressed a lot of the media that saw him for the first time over the summer. Uh, just how much better he looked than people expected given that he split half his time between football and basketball i think he can emerge to become a reliable you know second or third center uh kind of play five six seven minutes a night and then antonio troll he's kind of a mystery Pykele has been really high on him from the offseason workouts i'm not sure if he's ready to be a big contributor he came in late he's still learning he's still young so we'll see i think he has maybe a chance later on in the season but uh those are the two guys i would guess but i i, I would think that you know, Rutgers played a pretty tight rotation last year. I think they'd probably stick to that. You know, eight guys, the the eight guy rotation will get slimmed down through the non conference. They'll play a lot of guys in the tomato can games by Big Ten play. They'll cut it down to the eight guys, and I think that's kind of those those eight guys. The f- starting five, then Dean Reber, Derek Simpson, and Andre Hyatt will be the the core eight uh, in this rotation. So Wolfolk will play in the event that the Big Ten refs assess two fouls in thirteen seconds on Cliff. Is that it's, since you know that's going to happen at some point? There's going to be a game. If Cliff right. gets the Miles Johnson treatment, yes, that, Miles that Johnson will treatment. Yeah, Though thanks. Cliff has gotten better at it, he was very bad at it in his freshman year, much like Miles. He got much better at it last year, but this year he's probably gonna have to be a lot more aggressive defensively, defending the rim because they don't have as many good defenders as they had last year. So if he has to become more aggressive, does that result in more fouls? Does he get, earn any respect from the referees in the league? You know, Bo Borowski retired, so does do things change yeah. there? I mean, a lot of question marks there. But yes, if if Cliff ends up in a Miles Johnson situation, Dean Reber is gonna have to play a lot, and then Antoine Wolfolk will relieve uh, Reber. I am fascinated by what, what Cliff will become this year because I, I know there's a lot of buzz about him being all right. He's going to be a first round NBA draft pick. And he certainly got the talent, but I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of big 10 big men not get drafted. I mean, it's kind of, no one's looking for the back to the basket center. I guess that that's not, that's not Cliff certainly, but he's got to show he's got the, he's got the, you know, the outside game too, doesn't he? I mean, it's, that's gotta be a part of it. And the inclination in this Steve Peichel offense is not exactly to have have your your six ten center floating out to the three point line. I mean, is this game going to be much different? You think from from, from last year? Well, this is the second straight off season that they say that he's learning or getting better yeah. at shooting from the outside. Uh, and so he has the green light. He's going to be able to shoot. He shot a little bit during the exhibition. And as Steve Peichel has seen willing to let him shoot, I'm interested to see what happens when they're playing Michigan in January and it's a tight game. And Cliff is, I don't know if he's going to be shooting threes then. That's my question. Um, but he certainly looked good, fluid shooting the ball against Fairfield. Uh, he looked dominant inside, like dominant. Again, right. a smaller, smaller center in Fairfield, but he looked very physically imposing. I think he'll be really, really good inside. And if he could add that mid range shot, if he could hit a three, you know, one three a game at 35%, I, I don't know if he'll be a first round pick. I think that those expectations are a bit high, but I can yeah. certainly see him being, you know, a second round flyer because the guy is just oozing potential, just right. oozing potential. So, and, uh, and the other part of this, he's got to protect the rim too. That's the other part of this that sets, you know, we need to see him develop a little bit more defensively. Absolutely. Yeah. I th- and I think Booker's needs him to be because, as I mentioned, the guard guard, the, the guard defense is not uh, exactly strength on this team. When you look at you know the starting five of Paul Mulcahy and Cam Spencer, uh, yeah. you'd have to hope that Caleb McConnell plays really well defensively to kind of clean up for those mistakes. And that when those guys do blow by the defenders, because it's going to happen, we saw it uh, unless, you know, Paul had a struggle against Notre Dame's guards in the NCAA tournament. When they do get to the rim, they're going to need Cliff to be imposing and defend the rim and to defend a lot of these great big men in the league like Zach Eady and, and Trace Jackson Davis and all the, and Hunter Dickinson, all these other great guys is, that he's going to be going against. This is exciting. I feel like Dave White. I'm getting all excited about hoops all of a sudden. All right. Uh, one last hoop question. Andre Hyatt theory. This is Tony and Lawrence. <laughs> I didn't know there'd be an Andre Hyatt theory, but we've got an Andre Hyatt theory that he, that uh, on, uh, Tony thinks that he was trying to be Vinny Microwave Johnson last year. And he wants me to explain that reference to the two of you. I'm going to yeah. trust that, you know, I'm going to trust, you know, who Vinny Microwave Johnson was. That's good. Yeah. Uh... I, I might need the explanation. No idea who this guy is. You don't really? Oh, come on. This is not, this is not Mary Tyler Moore. You just look it up. Go, go, go Google some YouTube videos. Anyway, he was, he was uh, instant, instant offense off the bench. 
uh, during the 80s, uh, Vinny Michael Johnson. Uh, but that's not his game, Tony says. I think, I hope, with longer stints, without that mentality, he will let his game come to him and be a consistent scorer this year. Are they going to be – I guess the question is, are they going to be looking for him to score, Brian? They're going to need him to come off the bench. and Some of uh, the score, right? Yeah, I guess that's a good point. They're going to need him to score a bit, uh, to shoot better than he did last year. To mm -hmm. The issue that he had last year was that his short sprints, he always seemed to make one mistake every time he came on the court. I think there was right. a three-game stretch where he traveled once, at least once every game. It, it just, they just need him to come on, hit the occasional shot when he needs to, make his free throws, which he showed he can do, and that huge uh, you know, finish at Indiana that Steve Michael likes to bring up whenever he mentions Andre Hyatt. Uh, just... Do things like that. Take take the opportunities that he gets and and play do them well. Uh, I think that's kind of going to be his role as a, I think again seven eight minute uh, uh, minute guy. Uh, and he just has to when his number's called come in and and perform. All right, and finally, and Pat, I can't read this, but I sent this to the two of you guys uh, this morning. And at the end of my, I'm always fascinated at the end of this this thing I do at the games. The, the five observations I just put it. I throw in some random thing about you know something something that I wouldn't think people would care about. But I mentioned the horn at the game. And I said, the, the guy who ran the horn had a bad game against Michigan. The horn was the horn was off. He blew the horn, you know, and celebration when Michigan scored. It did like a half horn. That's just like unacceptable level of horn horning at the Michigan game. And Brian from Howell sent what I can only describe. <laughs> it's a 1500 word rant about the horn. Do we need to get rid of the horn, Pat? Is this what you think we're at that point that the horn should go? Yeah, I do. I do. You're done with the I, horn. I made so many great points about the cannon really being good. enough. The, the cannon, cannon is enough. You have a cannon. Why do you have yes. a horn if you have a cannon? Right. <laughs> These guys get dressed up as George Washington, and you're gonna horn. You're gonna have a horn too. Come on. I agree. I've never liked it. I didn't realize this until Brian from Howell sent me this rant about it. He's totally right. Enough with the horn. You don't need 20 different sound things. You got the light show now. You got, you still got the cannon. You got those guys loading that. And they're not, the cannon has never missed. I have not heard the cannon misfire in my time. I'm sure someone's going to send me an email now. Oh, you forget in the game against, you know, you know, Temple in 2003, the cannon misfire. But I do not, I've never heard the cannon misfire. So my, I'm down. Sorry, my, my issue with all, a couple things. One, I think they do the horn extensively more than usual because on third downs because uh, as I can't remember who exactly texted us uh, like a month ago on the show about the uh, third down third down chant the student section does that uh, has that naughty word uh, oh, about uh, certain think the horn is trying to drown out the bad chant. Is that what you it's a, it's a theory. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing about okay. th this is the whole game day, you know, music and make some noise sounds they do and the horn it's an issue with American sports crowds and that they can't generate these, these environments that they do in European soccer, you know, as a big European soccer soccer fan and, uh, you know, fan myself, the, the chance are the best part of the game or one of the best parts of the game. The environment that fans create is great. And uh, that just doesn't exist in a lot of American sports. It doesn't exist yeah. certainly at Rutgers uh, and it doesn't exist outside of the great environments in college football. So if can you, uh, cut, him, can you cut him off, Steve, can you cut yeah, him off? I'm doing the best I can. I, I was going to, if I had that Vuvuzela, I would be blowing him <laughs> to, to shut uh, him up. You guys don't know the beautiful sound of a crowd of 30,000 oh, people God, singing a beautiful song to their club. Yes. You guys don't get it. Uh, you know and what? I guess, you know what, Pat, you know what's happening here too? We got the, we got the freaking world cup starting. He's just going to be in something. Oh, God. Did Portugal qualify for the world cup? Portugal. Yeah. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. They're going to announce their squad on Thursday. <laughs> they're going to, I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. They're going to draw their first three games in the group. Can we get gonna, to the predictions already, Steve. They're going to get out in second place. And then they're going to uh, lose two, one to Brazil in the round of 16. And I'm going to say the coach should get fired and he won't get fired. And then I'm going to be mad for four years. Anyway, let's go to predictions. Wait, no, but I want to know. Is it, so uh, is, is the U.S. going to make it out of the group? They're in a group with what? With Wales and England. Chad, who else is in the group? Chad is not in the World Cup, no. <laughs> who else is in the group? It's England and uh, two other teams that aren't going to qualify. Wait, so they're matter. in they're in the same they're in the same group with England and Wales. Or am I making Wales up? I just I think you're making Wales up. It's USA and England, England playing on Black Friday. I don't know anything gotcha. else. Okay, all right. I think so, Wales is in it actually. Wales did make it, or am I just thinking of that that no, I'm watching that show? Right. Right. I'm watching the show uh, that. Uh, <laughs> that Ant Man and uh, the guy from uh, It's Always Sunny in, in Philadelphia. It's a great show. Uh, Rick Wrexham. Uh, yeah, great. yeah. Okay, yeah. it's USA, England, Wales, and Iran. <laughs> it's Wales. I got that right. Why would not? Why wouldn't the United Kingdom just have all of their players? Play? Why would you separate it? It's hard enough to win. Why not combine Wales, 
UK, Scotland, get all the players. You know, it's got to be that wouldn't be a better chance to win because of the majestical songs, Steve. Aren't you listening? The the the, the songs in Wales are just so glorious. It's like if if you put them with the English soccer players, it just wouldn't be good. Come on. God, I'm gonna get an angry email about this. All right, let's do predictions. So I thought at halftime I I had one. I had the easiest up by three. I had 27 points coming to me, and I so and it's unbelievable that they didn't cover. So that's on me though, and I think I'm almost mathematically out of this thing at this point. It might just be between the two of you, but I'm gonna do my best to make a comeback. Um, what's the line on this game? 11 points. Okay. All right. Uh, who wants to go first? Pat, you want to go first this week? Oh, the leader goes first. That's how it goes. Are you the leader? No, Brian's the leader. Brian's the leader. That's right. All right. Fonseca, what's your pick? Michigan State got that big win over Illinois last week. I think people are going to be overrating them a bit because of that. I still think Michigan State is one of the worst teams in this division. I think Rutgers is desperate to get one more win out of the season. I think Gavin Wimsett is going to have the game without the interception. I think wow. Rutgers is going to win 26 6 6 18. Whoa, you're picking, you're picking the Scarlet Knights. The leader in the contest is picking the Scarlet Knights to win despite an 11 point spread. You're giving us an opening. The I door love it. is the open. The door is open. I'm what are you going to do, dagger. lady? What are you ah, going to do? Or the dagger. This changed everything. This did change everything. I suddenly. See, the I order matters. Changed. The order matters. The order does matter. Well, what are you going to, what are you going to do now? What are you doing? Wow. Yeah, I think Michigan State is a really good team, and especially in this Big Ten grinder that we're going to see on Saturday. Just makes me think that Michigan State's really going to cover it this week. <laughs> this is this is trans. There's, there's, come on, this couldn't be any any more transparent. You you weren't going to pick. Were you going to pick this before Fonseca went on this limb? I was not. I I, I was going to pick <laughs> Rutgers to cover, but now we got the opening we need. So. Greg mentioned in his press conference that this was going to be a real old school Big Ten game where you're going to have to grind it out and run the ball and play great defense. And what has Rutgers not done lately? They have not run the ball a lick. Michigan State can run the ball, and I think that's going to be a huge advantage in a game that's really cold and and balmy and tough to throw the ball and windy. So I am going to go with Michigan State. Uh, Let's go Michigan State. 24 Rutgers 14. No, sorry, Rutgers. <laughs> Rutgers 10. 24 10 Michigan State. All right. I was going to pick I was going to pick Michigan State to cover before Brian went out on his limb. So at least that's what I'm going to tell you guys for the record. I'm going to do it anyway. I just I just, you know, again, it's I think it's a tough place to play. I uh, get it that Rutgers won there in, in Greg Shannon's first year. This team is more talented than it looks. Uh, I, and I just think the mistakes that they're making offensively, the lack of the running, running game, as you mentioned, Pat, uh, I, you know, I just think it's going to be a tough game uh, for them to win. I think it might be a low scoring game. I'm going to go 20 to seven Michigan state victory. All right. Uh, is that it? That's all we got. Anything else we need to add? Women's basketball open today with a victory. Uh, women's soccer NCAA tournament coming up. Wrestling opens at College Avenue Gym for wrestling it there for the first time in a couple of years nice. uh, because of the scheduling conflict with women, women's basketball. But they're pumped up to uh, to get to that match versus Clarion Friday night, and it will be Coach Scott Cadell's 200th victory, the guy who's done tremendous work for that program. That's incredible. It's not like they don't get like you know 30 wins a year either. That is right. it's a long right. it's a long track record of success. Congratulations. It's 16 years. Coach Cadell. Too. 16 good. years. That's pretty damn good. Absolutely. All right, so we'll be back after Michigan State to recap that, talk some more hoops, get the last couple of games of the season in. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Devco, and we'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com insider.